Welcome to this AQA GCSE Geography Revision Blast. Today we're focusing on the Resource Management Unit and we're looking at the UK overview before moving on to the food option. This is part of the challenge of resource management that you will find on paper too. Our first activity is altered vowels. Each of the key terms shown have had the vowels changed to an alternative which makes them tricky to work out. You just need to work out what the key phrases are and they are all linked to the UK overview of resource management. To give you a little bit of a clue, the first two are going to be about food, three and four are about water, and five and six are about energy. So here we go. So this one is to do with food. Okay, hopefully it's a nice easy one to get started. It is food miles which is a distance covered supplying food to customers from field to fork. Right, number two. Again, to do with food. So this is something that has increased in popularity over the last couple of decades. Let's have a look. It is organic produce. It's food produced without the use of chemicals. So not using fertilizers and not using pesticides. Right, this one is to do with water. Okay, let's have a look at what it might be. So let's reveal. It is a water stress. So it's, this is when the demand for water exceeds the supply in a certain period or when poor quality restricts the use of that. Okay, also to do with water. Okay, let's reveal. It is water transfer scheme, so matching supply with demand by moving water from an area with a water surplus to another experiencing water deficit. So in the UK, you might move water from the northwest down to the southeast. Right, the last two, remember, are to do with energy. So what do we think this one might be? So let's reveal. It is the energy mix, a range of energy sources of a region or a country, both renewable and non-renewable. And this changes all the time. It changes day to day, but it also changes over the long term as well. So if we think about over the long term, we are using much less fossil fuels than we've used in the past, but they also change on a daily basis. So we might have some days in the UK where we have a huge proportion of energy that is produced using wind power because we have windy days. It does, yeah, changes day to day based on sort of different variables. Right, last one for altered vowels. Okay, have we spotted it yet? Let's have a look. It is energy security. So this is the idea of uninterrupted availability of energy sources at an affordable price. And we could argue that in the UK that we don't really have this at the moment. We're very dependent on other countries for our energy, which means that it makes our supply quite insecure anyway. And our prices in the last year have skyrocketed. Much of that is down to the um, the Ukraine and Russia conflict, but we've also got energy companies creaming off huge profits and not really passing those on. Um, to their consumers. And we were warned before Christmas that over the winter months, we might actually find we had blackouts, although we didn't, but we were warned that that could happen. Right, let's move on to our next activity. So we are focusing on food miles. So that was our first altered vowels. What we'd like you to do is to put these imports in order of food miles from those travelled the furthest to those who have travelled the least distance. So if you pause the video for a moment, pop them in the right order. So furthest away first. And then once you've got them in what you think is the right order, unpause the video and we will check to see whether you have got them right or not. Okay, if you haven't paused already, please do. Let's reveal the answers. So in the first place, we've got Lamb from New Zealand traveling over 18,000 kilometers, in fact, 18,800 kilometers. We then got B from Argentina coming across the Atlantic, traveling 11,600 kilometers. Prawns from Thailand at nine and a half thousand kilometers. Mangoes from Brazil at 9,200 kilometers. 
beans from Kenya at 6,800 kilometers, and bananas from Dominica in the Caribbean, which is five and a half thousand kilometers. Okay, and there are all sorts of issues with food miles, obviously, particularly the amount of CO2 that is emitted the, if you are bringing in products from thousands of miles away. Right, we're going to move on to a red herring round this time. So you are going to see four items. You have to decide what's the odd one out and why. And we've got three of these to complete. So our first one is here. So washing clothes, showering, flushing toilets and manufacturing. Which of those is the four? So which of those four is the odd one out and why? So if you can pause the video for a moment, if you need a little bit of time to think. So let's reveal the answer, which is the odd one out and why. It is manufacturing because the other three are domestic uses of water. Right, let's move on to number two. Increase in water intensive appliances, growing population, more homes are being built and water conservation. Which of the four items is the odd one out and why? Again, if you need to pause to have a little bit of think, please do. So which of those is the odd one out and why? Let's reveal. It is water conservation. The others are for reasons why the UK demand for water is increasing. Why our last red herring is this. Industrial discharge, imposed fines, fertiliser runoff and chemicals from old mine workings. Which of the four items is the odd one out and why? Okay, pause the video if you need to. We are about to reveal. Okay, it is imposing fines. The others are sources of water pollution. And obviously you can be given fines if you are caught as a company dumping any of those things into local rivers. Let's move on to a connection wall. So on the screen you have 12 phrases. These need grouping into three and they are all to do with water and conservation. So what we're going to do is we're going to get you to think about the three different groups of phrases here, but we're going to give you a little bit of a clue. So I'm going to ask you firstly to find four phrases that are linked to recycled or reclaimed water. So four phrases that are linked to recycled or reclaimed water. Pause the video for a moment. Note down the four that you think are about recycled and reclaimed water. When you're happy that you've got the right four, unpause the video and we will check your answers. If you haven't paused the video, please do so, as we are about to reveal the first group. Right, let's have a look then. So our recycled and our reclaimed water are used in cooling, in steel making and energy production, reusing treated domestic or industrial waste water, used in fish farming and agriculture, and sewage pumped into lagoons to help algae grow and oxygenate, oxygenate water. So this, these are all to do with recycled and reclaimed water. So our next group is to do with grey water. Okay, so our next group of four is to do with grey water. If you haven't already paused the video, please do so because we are about to reveal. So grey water is used for irrigation and watering plants. It's taken from sinks, bath, showers, washing machines. It may contain traces of dirt, food, grease, hair and cleaning products. And if used within 24 hours, it provides valuable fertiliser for plants. What we would like you to do now is work out what links the last four. So we've got turn off tap when brushing teeth, only use washing machines and dishwashers for a full load, install low flow shower heads, and install a twin flush toilet system. What links this remaining four on the screen? I'll just give you a moment. If you need a bit longer, then please pause. So what links our last ones? Let's have a look. We've got turning tap on when brushing teeth, using only using washing machines and dishwashers when they are full, installing a low flow shower head or installing a twin flush toilet system. And of course they are all ways to save water at home. If you work that out, 
then well done. Right, let's move on to a bubble quiz. So with a bubble quiz, the number of answers that are correct can range from zero to all four. Your job is to identify the correct ones. Question one, why has the UK's demand for energy decreased? So A, new homes being built. B, decline of heavy industry. C, better home insulation. D, population growth. So why has the UK's demand for energy decreased? Okay, let's reveal the answers. It is B and C, decline of heavy industry and better home insulation. Number two, which of these energy sources are non-renewable? Is it A, oil, B, coal, C, gas, D, nuclear? Okay, identify the correct answers. There we are, oil, coal and gas. Number three. Which of these issues are associated with wind farms? A, risk to birds. B, visual impact on the landscape. C, decommissioning process. D, wastewater going into habitats. So which are associated with wind farms? Let's reveal. It is the risk of bir to birds and the visual impact on the landscape. Number four. Which of these countries does the UK import coal from? France, Colombia, Australia, or the USA? Okay, so we're looking for countries that we import coal from. So Colombia, Australia, and the USA, we do not import coal from France. And question five, which of these are associated with fracking? A, fewer emissions than traditional sources. B, the possibility of earthquakes. C, pollution of groundwater and D, expensive extraction process. So we'll just leave those up for a moment. So which are associated with fracking? Let's reveal the answers. It is all of them. So it is a really controversial uh, way of creating energy. Let's move on to a categorised activity. We are focusing on nuclear energy with this activity. We have down the side, eight impacts of nuclear energy. You have a minute to sort them into economic and environmental. Off we go. Okay, let's have a look. So our economic impacts are that it's expensive to build, high cost to produce electricity, decommissioning is expensive, but it does create jobs and boost local economy by the new plants. There are lots of environmental impacts. It does produce fewer emissions and other non-renewable sources. Processing and storing is difficult. There is a potential for toxic or radioactive spills and the warm water that comes as a waste byproduct impacts river habitats. And our final activity of the UK overview section of this revision blast is a quick MCQ round. So we've got five multiple choice questions. Our first one is, in 2016, how much of the UK's primary energy supply came from renewable energy? Was it A, 7%, B, 17%, C, 27%, D, 37%. Let's reveal, it is 17%. It has, in the last few years, increased significantly beyond that. Number two, in which sea does the UK have the largest reserves of oil and gas? Is it A, the Irish Sea, B, the English Channel, C, the North Sea, or D, the Celtic Sea? 
let's reveal. It is the North Sea. So there are lots of platforms, particularly off the coast of Scotland, where lots of oil and gas drilling takes place. Number three, identify the main form of renewable energy used to produce the UK's electricity supply. Is it A, hydroelectric power, B, solar, C, wind, or is it D, tidal? Okay, let's reveal it is wind. And there were some occasions last year where on certain days of the year, wind energy accounted for about 35% of all energy in the energy mix that day. Number four, identify the form of energy which can be extracted using the process of fracking. Is it A, oil, B, coal, C, shale gas, or is it D, bitumen? Okay, let's reveal. It is shale gas, so it's a gas that's stored in rocks. And our last question before we move on to the optional topic is number five, which type of energy makes use of uranium? Is it A, nuclear, B, wind, C, biomass, or D, hydroelectric power? Let's reveal. It is, of course, nuclear. So well done if you got those correct. So we're now going to move on to the food option content. We're going to start this with a 60 second challenge. You have 60 seconds to match the key term with its definition, matching the letters on the left with the numbers on the right. Let's go. Okay, let's see how you got on with matching those up. So A4 goes together famine, which is a widespread shortage of food, usually as a result of a period of drought, resulting in malnutrition, starvation and increased mortality. B3 is food deficit when the demand for food exceeds the supply of food. C5 is food insecurity when people are without reliable access to a sufficient quantity of affordable nutritious food. E2 is food riots, social unrest in response to increases in food prices, which may occur due to crop failure. We've then got E1 overgrazing, feeding too many livestock for too long on the land, trampling the land and stripping vegetation, leading to soil erosion and soil degradation. And then finally, we have F6, which is undernutrition, where people don't have enough nutrients to cover their needs for energy and growth which makes them vulnerable to sickness and disease. Well done if you got those correct. We're going to move on to a give me three challenge. So what I would like you to do is to note down three reasons why some countries are at risk of food insecurity. You have 30 seconds. Okay, let's have a look. So three reasons why some countries are at risk of food insecurity. We've got many countries have hot, dry climates, which means crops struggle to grow properly. Many farming inputs are expensive. So for example, irrigation systems, chemicals, your fertilizers and pesticides. So lots of farmers that perhaps would benefit from using those can't afford to. And population growth naturally means that there is a higher demand for food. OK, let's do it again. This time we're looking for three impacts of food insecurity. Off we go.
Okay, hopefully you've managed to come up with three. Let's have a look. Okay, so we have famine leading to malnutrition and starvation, rising food prices due to increased prices for animal feed, storage and transport, and then that obviously can lead on to social unrest. So those spikes in food prices can lead to food riots where people are desperate and they start fighting over resources. So well done if you got three, and if you got those three, even better. Right, let's move on to a round of altered vows. So we are now going to focus on strategies to increase food supply, each one that you are going to see has had the vowels changed to a different vowel, so they, the words look um, slightly different. Let's see if we can work out what they are. So our first one is a really common one, something that we see in the summer all the time in this country, if you live in a rural community. Have we worked this one out? Let's reveal. It is irrigation, which is the artificial watering of crops to maintain production. So this increases crop yields and therefore income. So it does increase food security, but it is quite expensive, particularly if you have a large scale system and it can lead to over abstraction where too much water is taken and there's less water for other uses, which can then lead to the drying out of lakes in the long term. Another issue is it can lead to waterlogging of soil if the land isn't drained properly and you can also have salinization where you have a build-up of salts. Right, let's move on to the next one. So these two are quite high-tech solutions. Do we recognise these ones? Okay, let's reveal. It is hydroponics and aquaponics. So hydroponics is all about growing plants in nutrient-rich water, whereas aeroponics is growing plants using air instead of soil. Now, because the water and nutrients are delivered directly to the plant, this kind of food production is very efficient and it does enable crops to grow all year round indoors. And you don't need to have much space. Um, you can move your crops around quite easily, but they are really expensive to set up and run because they require quite a lot of heat and light and they do need technical expertise. The equipment can also break down really easily. Um, other people sometimes argue that the produce doesn't taste as good if it's made in this sort of environment. Let's move on to our third. What do we think this one might be? Okay, are we ready for a reveal? It is the Green Revolution. So this is all about scientists developing new strains of higher yielding seeds. So it happened firstly in um, Asia in the 1960s, so in India in particular, but there's now a Green Revolution happening across Africa. Now, this is a good thing because it does increase yield and some crops can then um, better withstand drought. Today, the focus is all about sustainable farming rather than just increasing yield like it was. And things like conserving biodiversity by preserving drought resistant strains or crop wild relatives, um, for example. It's all about protecting soil and water sources as well and ensuring the well-being of local communities. But the techniques are quite expensive. OK, next one. Let's have a look at this one. So hopefully this one is a bit easier to recognise. Let's have a look. It is biotechnology. So this is all about genetically modifying plants and animals. So injecting the genes from one plant to another would be an example of that. And most of the modifications are done to make plants resistant to pests and diseases. So they... Um, so it leads to an increase in food security. But you can also modify plants to have more vitamins or proteins or to have a better flavour or to have a longer shelf life. And they can also be modified to be grown in poor conditions. So, for example, in droughts. But they're quite controversial. Many people are quite concerned about the possible knock on impacts on the environment and human health of these genetically modified um, organisms. Right. Last one. So the first word here is sometimes, uh, can sometimes be swapped to intermediate. Hopefully you recognise the second word. So let's have a look. 
Appropriate te technology, also known as intermediate. So this is all about low tech projects that are cheap and they're managed by the local community. So for example, by putting in a drip irrigation scheme and they use machines and tools which are simple and cheap to operate. And that means that they're accessible to communities in low income countries. And it does increase the output and food production without putting people out of work. So it doesn't use huge mechanisation schemes, for example, which do put farmers out of work. It is small scale, so it doesn't increase food supply as much as some other methods, but it is more appropriate for low income countries. OK, now moving away from the idea of appropriate technology, in lots of countries, we are seeing large scale food production through huge agribusinesses, which use are very expensive and they use lots of input. So irrigation systems and chemicals. What we want to think about are what are the benefits of large scale food production and what are the drawbacks? So what I would like you to do with this on balance activity is to pause the video for a couple of moments and note down two benefits of large scale food production. When you've got two benefits down, restart the video and we will see what you've come up with. Okay, if you haven't already paused the video, please do so because we are about to reveal. So let's have a look at two benefits. So we've got a greater availability of food. And it often means that we've got cheaper food for customers because obviously we are making it in, in bigger, um, a much bigger scale. We have the increasing yields, which means that you've got more income for farmers. And that means that the quality of life of those farmers increases. However, there are lots of drawbacks. So can you again pause the video and note down a couple of drawbacks of large scale food production? Once you have got them down, then unpause and we'll check what you've got. Okay, let's have a let's check. So we have got mechanization. So often huge machines are involved in this process to increase efficiency, but it does mean that there is a reduction of jobs for agricultural workers and it is very um reliant on chemicals and expensive irrigation systems. So the inputs are huge, which means it's not appropriate for everybody, but obviously having a big impact. So having a big reliance on chemicals can mean that you've got the issues with chemicals being washed into waterways, causing water pollution and all sorts there. So well done if you got those correct. Right, we are now thinking about how to make food production more sustainable. So we're going to do a round of missing vowels this time. So each of the strategies used to make food production more sustainable has had its vowels taken out. So you just need to have a look at them and try and work out the key strategies. OK, it's our first one. OK, what do we think? It is organic farming, so not using any sorts of chemicals here. So small scale can it result in more expensive pro produce for the, con for the um, consumers. OK, here's our second one. So we'll leave it up for a moment for you to try and work out. OK, have we got this one? Let's have a look. It is permaculture, which is food production that follows the patterns and features of natural ecosystems. And it includes things like harvesting rainwater, composting waste and redesigning gardens to include a wide variety of plants and trees, which provide a range of wildlife habitats. Practices also include crop rotation, keeping animals like sheep and pigs and bees and managing woodland as well. So well done if you got that one correct. Number three. OK, so second word hopefully is relatively easy. What do we think the first one is? Let's have a look. It is urban farming. So this is the cultivation, processing and distribution of food in and around settlements, sometimes using allotments, but also sometimes using more interesting ideas such as vertical farming in old office spaces or even making use of old underground tunnels. And they're really good for attracting wildlife such as birds and butterflies into urban areas. Right, number four. So second word, hopefully easy to spot. First word, a bit more tricky. I'll give you a clue. It is how we used to eat. 
Okay, let's reveal. It is seasonal food. So, so seasonal food is all about how we used to eat when we bought food from local farms or markets and could only buy whatever fruit and vegetables were in season at the time. Whereas now, because of better storage and faster transport around the world, it's possible to eat every type of food throughout the year. Eating seasonal produce, though, bought locally is much more sustainable as it reduces food miles and reduces our carbon footprint. And it usually tastes better as well. Right, last one. Okay, have we recognised this one? So this is something that has really sort of come into media attention in the last decade or so. Let's have a, have a look. It is reducing food waste. So it's about reducing what we throw away. So currently we throw away about a third of our food, which obviously is not good news, particularly when we have a cost of living crisis taking place and food prices are becoming more and more expensive. So we could reduce this with better labelling in supermarkets, processing food to increase shelf life and not rejecting food for cosmetic reasons. So some of you will have seen that supermarkets have been selling uh, so-called wonky veg in recent years, which is a lot cheaper. So well done if you managed to get those correctly. Right, we're going to round off this revision blast with five true or false statements. So our first one is irrigation is always good for the land. Is this true or false? Let's have a look. It is a false. So it can lead to waterlogging. It can lead to build up of salts as well. Number two, pests such as locusts can devastate crops in many countries. Is this true or false? Let's have a look. It is true, particularly in low income countries. So in places um, across northern Africa, for example, um, plagues of locusts often wipe out the whole crops. Number three, undernutrition can lead to stunting, which limits children's physical growth. Is this true or false? OK, let's have a look. It is true. And this can happen in high income countries as well. It isn't just a low income country phenomena. Number four, permaculture means using land permanently for farming without taking a break. True or false? have a look no it's false we just covered this one in our missing bowels activity and the last one consumers across the globe are demanding more food and a wider variety of food than in previous decades is this true or false okay let's have a look it is true so this is why we have this increased issue with food miles because we are you know, we've got used to having a much more varied diet than we previously used to. So we're not really interested in just embracing seasonal foods. Well done for getting to the end of this revision blast. We've covered the UK overview of and food in this resource management and vision blast. Hopefully, lots of the activities that we've done have helped you recall key aspects of both of those sections of this unit, and they are going to help you go into that paper two exam feeling a little bit more confident. If you haven't already done so, please check out our other revision blasts on the playlist because we have got them in place for all of the subtopics across the specification. And the last thing for me is just to wish you the very best of luck in your papers. Good luck.